Man, it's great to see everybody out today. Gosh, a lot of folks here today. Uh, I know we've had some folks that have been traveling, so glad you had a good time, had a good trip. Uh, always great to see everyone come back. Uh, Ms. Jerry and I were talking earlier, another gorgeous morning. Uh, man, some beautiful weather. Some, this last week was some screwy weather. But, uh, hey, man, God's given us a beautiful day today. Now, before we jump into the uh, message, I want to see if any of y'all took this last week to learn the new memory verse for the month. Does anybody, anybody know it already? And remember, I gave you a little handy way to help remember it. So does anybody, anybody want to jump up and say it for us today? What's the reference? I was going to say, does anybody know the reference first? <laughs> right, Miss, who's, some, was that Miss, oh, okay. Miss Artis said it's Romans. We got that part so far. We narrowed down the book. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Well, it's just 2. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And uh, remember, I'm, uh, I'm learning in the uh, New King James Version. But again, you know, whatever version works for you is the best one. And the version that uh, I'm learning it in, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, uh, remember I told you, remember, if that law, the, well, the verse again is broke down in three parts, and the third part is broke down in three parts. Remember the good, G, acceptable, A, and perfect will of God. Just remember gap, and uh, you'll get it, and you will get it. Well, man, it is great to have you, uh, everyone here today. You got your copy of God's Word with you. You got it ready? You ready? Whatever, whatever uh, version it's in, if it's paperback, electronic, or whatnot. Uh, whatever translation you've got, 
I hope you got it with you today. And I was just thinking about it. You know, is God's Word, is it really special to you? Is it special to you? A lot of you shaking your head, yeah. Why is it? Why is God's Word special to you? Anybody want to tell us why? I'll tell you why. Because it's life-giving. That's right, man. It gives us life, eternal life. Literally. It gives us eternal life. Anybody else? Why is God's Word special to you? It was written by God and it's our connection with Him. That's right. That's a great way to put it. It's exactly. That's how He does connect with us. That's why it's so great, Miss Deb, to read it every day. And that way he can. He can connect with us through his word. That's a great way to put it. Miss Pamela. We have somebody we know we can trust and we don't trust. What was that now? We have someone who, that Lord, we can go to the Lord in prayer and know that we can trust in him and um, he will guide us and answer our prayers. That's right. You know, we can trust his word. We know it's true. And then, like you said, he can guide us as we read it. So, you know, I hope God's word is special to you. Because uh, really, you know, until God's Word is special to us, we're never going to be able to live the life that He has for us. So I hope you'll get, uh, get into God's Word every day. Speaking of getting into God's Word, let's do uh, old-fashioned, how about this morning, an old-fashioned sword drill. I mean, y'all know what those are, right? Old-fashioned sword drill. Are you up for it? Sure. Okay, you're up for it? Uh, I don't think those that do electronic, I don't know if they got an advantage over on us or not. They still got to type the book in. But anyway, uh, this is going to be a hard passage for you to find. It's going to be very difficult. Think you can handle it? Sure. All right, Miss Eleanor, she's going to try it. Uh, everybody close your Bible. Don't cheat. Good gracious, don't cheat on a, on a sword drill, okay? But now I'm going to say the passage. I'll say it twice, and then when I say go, you go. Okay, that means to the passage. Don't go out the door. But the passage, real hard to find, it's Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Go. Whoever gets it, when you get it, raise your hand. Somebody, when you get it, raise your hand. And now, like I have to sweep. Okay, Ms. Deb's got it. Anybody else got it? Ron's got it. Some of you still looking through the book of contents. Okay, Ms. Deb, okay. Hey, uh, well, somebody that has got it already, tell us, what does Genesis uh, chapter 11 start out talking about? That's right, Miss Linda. It's so crazy. I hate the mask. You know, it's just like... <laughs> but uh, the Tower of Babel, you're exactly right. You know, I go deliver parts during the week every now and then, and, you know, I'm going there and say something to the guy, and he always say, what? 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 So I just take the mask off. Say, so forget it, man. But anyway, you're right, Miss Linda, everybody. It talks about the Tower of Babel. So y'all today, for our favorite story, familiar passage, whatever you want to call it, we're going to look at the events surrounding the Tower of Babel, and I'm going to entitle it today, Stairway to Heaven. Stairway to Heaven. And no, I'm not referring to the Led Zeppelin song for a change, all right? But anyway, in our look at Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9, we're going to consider these three points. First of all, we're going to think about the place, that is where it happened. We're going to think about the event, just how the tower came about, or almost came about. And then third, we're going to look at the end, just how God put the kibosh on their building plans. So let's read Genesis chapter 11. Hey, and I hadn't asked you to do this in a while, but stand up because you're not going to breathe on anybody. But in honor of reading God's word, let's stand and I will read Genesis 11. 1 through 9, you follow along in your copy of God's Word as I read here from the NIV. Translation I have goes like this. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. Just think about it. Let that soak in for a minute. And this is so cool to me studying it for this today because I've heard this since I was a little kid in Sunday school. So, as, you know, as always, I try to go at it with an open mind, an open heart. I want God to show me different things about it. So it was really cool thinking about this stuff today. Verse 2, it says, Now, as people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. So they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said... Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. 
But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. And so the Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they had begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. So come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. And that is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. And from there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Almighty God, as we look at this passage in your word, so familiar for many people, maybe the first time for some. But whatever it is, God, as we have said here today, your word is special to us, is precious to us. It's the very words of life to us, of eternal life. It's our way of connecting with you this day and every day. And in particular, God, today we want to connect with you and hear your message for our hearts today. So, Almighty God, I pray you would use the study of your word and the presenting of it. Take it, and as it goes out, God, may it prick our hearts where it needs to, may it encourage us as it needs, whatever. Lord, we know your word never goes out void, but it does what you want it to do. Keep the evil one from snatching it from our ears and stealing it later from our hearts. And God, we ask you this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we all said together, Amen. Hey, thank you. You can be seated. Well, y'all, as you think about all these verses together right here, this passage certainly confirms the truth that is found in Proverbs 19, 21, which says this, that man can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Again, Proverbs 19, 21, it says, you know, man can make many plans, but it's the Lord's purpose that shall prevail. And we're going to see that. Hey, now we're just going to, man, y'all today, we're just going to walk through this thing. We're going to be gone the next two weeks, so I won't get to preach. Um, you know, blessings to y'all. Reverend Tom is going to be here, so y'all come on and, and support him as always. And so uh, since I don't preach the next two weeks, Randy said I could preach as long as I want to today. Right. What, so, you know, so y'all put it on him anyway. <laughs> no. He didn't invite me to be quiet, man. I got to get going here. But anyway, we're just going to walk through this thing. And as we do, uh, if a question pops up in your mind, hey, man, just throw the hand up because I'd love to try to answer it. If I can't, I'll find out and uh, let you know later. Because I tell you, really, as I studied for today, I did. I said, God, I want to know this thing, what it's really supposed to mean, not just what I heard as a kid. I want to know what you're talking about here. So uh, I answered a lot of questions for myself as I studied. Well, as we get going here to better help us understand, I want to share uh, some background facts with you. Like, first of all, when did it happen? Everybody say, when did it happen? <laughs> well, I'll, ask, I'll tell you what I think anyway since you asked. I believe this may have happened some hundred plus years after the flood had concluded. And do y'all remember how many people got off of the ark when God rescued them from the flood. Y'all know how many people got off the ark? That's right. That's right, Ms. Laura. There were eight people. There were eight people got off of the ark. Of course, you know, it was Noah and his family. And again, every uh, commentary and whatever I studied, because I wanted to know how many people they're talking about here. And so from the best I can understand, everyone suggested maybe there were 30,000 plus people back on the earth by this time. Now, I tell you, my first question that I had was in verse 2 when it said that the people who moved eastward. So the first thing I wanted to know, who were the people that moved eastward? Well, let me ask you, who do you think they were? Who do you think these people were? Where were they from? The people that used to live in the West. Okay. <laughs> what well, did you say, Ms. Linda? The East. Okay, well, I tell you who these people were. They had to be from descendants of Noah. They had to be from the families of Noah's children, and that would be Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And think about it. Up to this time, they were one community that spoke one language, and they had one culture. Now, you know, we read that. I, first thing that jumped into my mind, anyone want to guess how many known and recorded languages there are in our world today? Anybody want to take a stab at it? 
Uh, yeah, you're right. And you'll find out in a minute what I found. Hey, you looked it up. Dang, I, did, I tried not to give him time to Google it. No, he read it early. But I take seriously from what's called a website, linguisticsociety.org. They say that there are over 6,000 recorded languages. Now, there may be more, but there are 6,009 recorded languages. And, y'all, that's in a world with a population of 7 billion 800 million people as of March of this year. Now, do any of y'all speak another language than English? Anybody in here? Can you speak another language? Hey, man, what, what is it? Okay. Uh, you, pretty fluent in it? Or you can get along at the restaurant, maybe? Okay, so-so. You know, well, that, of course, in college, we had to learn, uh, take uh, two semesters of the foreign language, so that's what I took, Spanish. You know, the only thing I remember from it was taco burrito. That's, you know, that's all I got. I don't know anything else. But I think, see, I would try and imagine a world where everybody is speaking the same language. You know, there wouldn't be any more of this. If you call a business, you get the recording to speak. And, uh, here, operator in English, press 1. Here, operator in Spanish, press 2. You know, there wouldn't be any of that stuff. There would be one language. So to our first point here, the place where... Did this happen? Now, verse 2, it says, As these people who were the descendants of Noah, as they reproduced, and there's up to 30,000 or so of them now, a large group of them moved eastward. Now, the first thing I wanted to know is, they moved eastward from where? Where are they going from? Well, we know, y'all. Isn't it so great? God don't leave us to guess, because back in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4, we see there that the Bible tells us that Noah's ark parked in the mountains of Ararat. In mountains of Ararat. I looked it up to see where that exactly was. That would have been the upper eastern region of what is today modern-day Turkey. It would be in the upper eastern corner there of modern-day Turkey. That's where those mountains are at. And so it says that the descendants of Noah, they moved from there and they're headed eastward. And actually, the way they're going, they're going kind of southeast. And how do I know that? I know that because the Bible tells us in Genesis 11, 2, where did they settle at? In an area called what? Starts with an S. You tell me. Shinar. Yes, Shinar. Shinar. Whatever it sounds like that. Well, we know that Shinar, it was a region in the area of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. It's the area of modern-day Iraq. And we know this area from the Bible as Babylon. Everybody say Babylon. Babylon. It seems like a lot of these stories we've been looking at in the Bible, they're in Babylon, around Babylon, or they concern Babylon, because Babylon was a big player in the Bible. Well, this is neat to me because I wanted to find out more about this area. This area, y'all, was founded by a guy called Nimrod. I don't know about, yeah, exactly, you know. I wondered, I wondered if y'all would think the same, because in my lifetime, whenever you thought somebody was a knucklehead, you would call him a what? Nimrod. You're a you Nimrod. I'm fixing to tell you about Nimrod, and this guy was anybody but someone you would have made fun of. Oh, uh, to his face, anyway. We know from Genesis chapter 10 that Nimrod, he was Ham's grandson. That would make him Noah's great-grandson. Well, he began, just one of the empires he began was the empire of Babylon. Nimrod is described as an aggressive tyrant of a man, a mighty hunter. The Bible calls him in Genesis chapter 10. But Brother Larry, you like to shoot guns and more of being a hunter of animals he was a hunter of people because what he liked to do was find where groups of people lived. He would go there and conquer them and take over their land and their civilization and conquer everything that they had. And again, from Genesis 10, verses 8 through 12, you can read there and see the empires that this guy began. One was Babylon. Another was Assyria. Another was Nineveh, which was in the area of Assyria. Y'all, all these cities that mentioned that Nimrod had a hand in founding, they were all ungodly, they were ferocious, they were vicious types of people. 
So this area of Shinar, where, you know, they created Babylon here, it was a rough area. These were some rough people. We would say they were from the wrong side of the tracks. But there were no tracks, man. It was just everywhere. They were not a God-fearing, God-worshipping people at all. Instead, they were mostly a vicious, meanful, spirited bunch of folks. So it sounds like a great place to live, right? You want to pack up and move over there today. Thank goodness most of it's gone. So anyway, that's the place in the area of Shinar. Now, number two, let's think about the event, how this tower came to be. Well, it's so funny to me, Ms. Deb, in verse 3, they get there, and the first thing they do is call a city council meeting, and they're going to talk about how they're going to go about building this new homeland of theirs. So they've got to build a city, and they've got to build a tower in the city, so they've got to have something to do it with, right? So the first order of business is to do what? We've got to make some bricks. We've got to make some bricks. And this is what's so neat. If you're not careful, and if, really be honest, if I wasn't studying for today, I'd have jumped right over it. But it says there, come and let us make bricks. Now, why are they going to record that in the Bible? Because that was an important thing. Because where this area was, y'all, it was mostly sandy. There was a lot of scrub trees there. And there were not very many rocks nor boulders. You know, like we got around here, there were no mountains to chip off the side of to make uh, boulders out of. So therefore, they had to take what they had, the natural resources they had, and they used them to make bricks. And then they, of course, you know, y'all know more about building than me, and they baked them in a what? In a kiln, K-I-L-N. Am I saying that right? Kiln? That's how you, you know, so they put the mud, straw mixture together, and then they would let it sit out in the hot Mideastern sun. Then they would stick it in these kilns where they would really dry them out, make them tough, and then they stacked them up, and had them ready to build with. So y'all, they had to make bricks because that's all they did have. Only thing they were going to have is what they made. And this is so cool right here. Archaeology, which I don't need archaeology to prove to me the Bible's real, but archaeological digs over in that area prove that that's what most all the buildings of Babylon were made with. Almost all the buildings that they have excavated are made with these bricks that they can tell were uh, heated in a kiln. I don't know. To me, that was just cool. I don't think it impressed y'all as much as it did me, but I like that. So they got their bricks. Well, to secure them together, they got no Home Depot lamps. They got no Lowe's. They got no Ace Hardware. Go buy a bag of sackcrete or whatever to stick them together. So the NIV said they used tar. Anybody got a King James Version? What's your say, Miss Peggy? Slime. I like that. King James says slime. And I bet all the kids volunteered to go get that, you know. But anyway, NIV says tar. King James says slime. Other translations say something different. Whatever word is there, they all refer to the same thing. There was a black, sticky substance that literally boiled up from the earth in that area. It was like tar pits is what it was. It was tar pits. So there God, you know, provided them with the natural resources to stick their bricks together. So this is what they're going to use to build their stairway to the heavens. And I'm calling it that, y'all, because as we're going to see in a minute, that's what they intended it to be. All right, well, now let's think. We know where it's happening. And where did, where's the place? Where's it taking place? Shinar, which we know as Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq, Iran. So we know where it's happening. So now let's think about the tower itself. Now, again, this was great to me. There were, there, again, archaeology. Archaeology has excavated. There are like two different types of towers that were built in that area. One of them is similar to the pyramids, except that with the pyramids, they were hollow on the inside, so Pharaoh could pack his household to go off into the next uh, life, which where he went, you know, everything he took was going to burn up anyway. So, but the pyramids were empty, whereas they were empty, the inside of these towers were packed with dirt because they didn't plan on somebody being buried inside of it. And so just like a pyramid, again, this was one style of tower there, it would come up and it would be recessed a little bit. So it would be like a what? A stairway so that the people could what? 
walk up the stairway and go to the top. And there's, I'll tell you in a minute why they wanted to get to the top. So that's one kind of tower that they dug up. Another style of tower that they dug up over there, it's round. It's a round tower. And to get up this tower, they built like a walking lane that goes around. You can Google this stuff. You know, if, if I'm lying, I'm dying. You can look it up and see what I'm talking about. But it was a round structure, and on the outside, a walking lane that just circled around and round so they, could, again, could walk up and get to the top, so they could get to the top. Well, y'all, whichever type they used, these were to be more than just a skyscraper. These were actually a religious structure. And maybe you were like me, because as a kid, I remember the Sunday school teacher saying, hey, no, they're building this tower because they want to reach heaven where God is. Well, one thing I found was the word tower in Hebrew, according to Strong's Concordance anyway, man, the word tower there is literally means of the clouds, of the clouds. And so I don't think they ever intended to build a tower to go all the way to heaven, wherever that is, to where God was at. They knew that'd be impossible. That'd be impractical. Have you ever tried to build Legos? How high do you get before they fall over? You, know, you couldn't build a tower to heaven. The thing's going to fall over. So y'all, to me, anyway, this is Drewology. This is what I'm thinking. Instead of them trying to build a tower that they think they can climb to get to where God is way out there, they're building this tower to bring heaven down to them. Because you see, these people, they were what most commentators call astral worshipers, A-S-T-R-A-L. That means they were worshipers of the what? Of the stars. Because when they looked into the night sky and they saw the stars, all the stars out there, every one of them to them was a god. That's how many gods there were to them. Wherever they saw a light in the sky, that was a god to them. So that's what these towers were built for. They were going to build this thing up, and on the top of it, there would be a worship center up there. Wouldn't do me any good, Brother Dennis, to go to church there. I'm afraid of heights. I'd never make it up there. I'd have to stay at the bottom. But that was the whole deal for the tower. It wasn't to build it all the way through space to where God was, because as we're going to see in a minute, they weren't building it to God, capital G. They were building this tower to God, little g, lowercase, and not just a God, but many gods. Because they wouldn't build just one tower, Miss Sandy. They built many of them. And on every one of these towers, it was built to worship a different God. You know, this Sunday, you can go to this church and worship this star. Next Sunday, you can go to that church and worship that star. So see, y'all, that's one reason this tower was so disturbing to Almighty God. Because we know there's how many God? How many God? There's one God. There are capital G. There is one true God. That is the only one. But by them building this thing, they were proposing that there were many gods and that there are many ways to get to heaven. And you know what, Laura? People still say the same thing today. That's why I'm not supposed to put down another religion that says there is another God, that there is another way to heaven besides Jesus Christ. Because they say Jesus isn't the only way. They say he is a way to heaven. Let me tell you, just like all those towers were wrong, all these people today that say there are many ways to get to heaven, they're wrong just as well. So anyway, you know, God thought this thing was idolatrous. So is it any wonder that he had to stop the building of it? Amen? Is it no wonder he had to stop this thing because it symbolized the arrogance of humankind and that they didn't need God. So there's the tower. So we've seen the place. We've seen the event, how the tower almost came to be, and why they were going to build this thing. I just want to make sure everybody's clear so far. We know where we're at. We're over in Iraq, right? It's hot, dry, sandy, so we're having to make these bricks ourselves, and we're building this tower so that we can do what? Go up and worship the gods, the star god, all the gods of the, the stars are. And so God don't like it. And so, of course, you know, some people have a problem with it. It says God looked down and said, we've got to go down and stop this thing. 
you know, to me, that's a reference to the Trinity. God says, hey, we, could be in, in, in the Hebrew Bible, I mean, the Hebrew language, you know, it literally, it's a plural word, we, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So God wasn't upset, y'all, and it didn't surprise him. But he saw what was going on, and he says, we got to stop this thing. And that leads to the third point, how God canceled the project. So y'all tell me in verse 7, what did God do to stop this thing? That's right, Miss Pamela. He confused their languages. He confused their languages. Man, I have never stopped to think about that. This is huge, y'all. This is huge. There's one common language in all of the earth. And now all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of them, and we don't know how many they are because the Bible doesn't tell us. But we know there's more than one now because they can't understand each other. So can you think in your head for a minute just how this really happened? You know, it's Thursday afternoon. They're all out there building. It's 4 o'clock, time to clock out and go home. Everybody's talking in the same language. You know, hey, man, see you in the morning. We'll start it again. But hey, tomorrow's Friday and one more day. We got the weekend. Everybody's, you know, in a good mood. They clock out and they all go home. They come back to work Friday morning and they all clock in and they all start walking toward their work site. And one of them walks up to the other to say good morning. And then it's like, what'd you just say? What did you say? And now I try to talk to you and I can't understand you. And I, most people can't understand me, my southern knees anyway, but... <laughs> You know, nobody suddenly can understand each other. The electrician can't tell the plumbers where to run the water. And the plumbers, you know, they can't understand what the bricklayers are saying. The truck drivers show up and say, where do you want this load of bricks? And they're telling them they don't know what they're talking about. It's crazy. All of a sudden, it was just mass confusion. Everybody was just talking gibberish. So just let that soak into your head for a minute. Because I never had before till I was studying for this thing the other day. How that must have been for those people. Hey, and uh, what was so funny to me, have you ever seen two people try to communicate that don't speak the same language? Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, one of them speaks English, one of them speaks Spanish. Well, what's the first thing they do? They get louder. And louder, that's right. As if talking louder is going to help them understand what they're trying to say. And then when talking louder doesn't work, what do they start doing? Exactly. You know, it's, ah, now I'm talking louder and I'm doing this. Now you should understand me. You nimrod. Why don't you know what I'm saying? You know, well, what happens? Eventually, the two people just get so frustrated. What do they do? Forget it. Exactly. They just walk off. That's exactly what happened here. These people could no longer understand each other. And I wonder how long they tried to understand each other. Finally, they just said, this ain't working. And so they just separate, and they all go their separate ways. And wait a minute, I'm not through with this thing yet. Think what that must have been like. Because this was home to all these people. Now these families, they're having to just uproot and take off to where... They have no idea. So families are standing there waving goodbye to each other. Little kids, Brother Terry, that had played in the dirt and the sand with each other, that went out there in that tar pit when mom told them not to and they got their clothes dirty. They've been playing together. They're best buddies. Now they can't understand each other. They hug for the last time. And with tears running down their little cheeks, they have to go their separate ways. Now all these people, they got to go look for a new, suitable place to live. And once they find wherever that is, they got to exist by hunting whatever is there, you know, and living in some kind of crude dwelling that they can throw up or in a cave they can find until they can support themselves by agriculture, you know, or taking advantage of the natural resources in that area. So again, man, this is a huge deal going on here. But who did they have to blame? Nobody to blame but their self. Hey, now, if you listen, say amen. amen. Some of y'all listen, so I heard Laura. I'm going to say it for her. 
Again, y'all, here's something else I never thought about before. As many times as I've heard this story, nobody ever brought it up. Why didn't God just come down and bam, destroy the tower and everybody that was building it? Why do you think? Why didn't he? Man, wouldn't that have been the easiest way to squash it? Just send off tornado, bam, blow the bricks apart and sweep up all the people with it and be done with them all. Turn the whole place into glass over there. Why do you think God didn't do it? And basically, y'all said the same thing. Laura said because he didn't want to destroy the whole world. That wasn't God's purpose. Exactly. The only answer is grace. You know, I've always seen this as a judgment on these people, which it was. It was a judgment on them. But it's also an example of God's grace. Because instead of just obliterating all of them, which let me tell you, that's what I'd have done. I'd have gotten rid of the whole lot of them. After they literally thumb me off, flick me off, I saved you from the flood. Now you're going to spit in my face? You're going to flip me off like that? You think you are. I'm going to squash you like a bug in a rug. That wasn't God's point. He was still merciful to them. And thank God he is. Amen? Amen. Because let me tell you, the first thing I thought, Miss Linda, he was merciful to them. Why didn't God just let me die in my ungodly, youthful ways? When I was in those car crashes, cars so mangled, people came upon them and said, there's no way anybody's living in that thing. The only reason God didn't kill them, he didn't kill me, he hadn't killed us all, is because of his grace. You know, they disobeyed God by not spreading out over the earth like he told them to do. And then they disrespected God by looking to other false, useless gods to worship. After he had saved their thankless souls from the flood. But here he is. God, once again, he's given them another chance at a new beginning. And guess what? How many of them you think blew it again? The whole lot of them. Man, why does God let the world keep spinning? I got no idea. Of course, I'd have done, had to do all with myself to start with. So there it is, friends, the Tower of Babel. And you know, it's ironic, the reversals and the contrast in this story. There's human effort that was surpassed by divine deed. There was the human deed of construction that triggered the city's divine deconstruction. And despite these people's monumental efforts, it's trying to build a tower that would reach up to the gods. Instead, what happened? God Almighty came down to confuse them. They wanted to stay together, but God did what? Y'all are too slow. God wanted them. They wanted to stay together, but God did what? He scattered them. Exactly. It's got to stay the same letter. Stay together, split up. Yes. Anyway, they wanted to make a name for themselves so that they would be famous, so that every time their name was spoken of in the annals of history, it would be out of great respect. Hey, Miss Peggy, they made a name for themselves, all right, and the name is Babel. And instead of being a name of respect, it's a name of humiliation because Babel literally means to what? It means confusion. So when we think of these people at the Tower of Babel, we don't think highly of them, do we? We think lowly. So to me, y'all, as I try to bring this thing together, because like I said, I know, you know, I won't be here two weeks. I'd love to keep going, but y'all got lives today. The overall overarching message of the Tower of Babel is this, is that human pride resulted in the Lord's punishment. Human pride resulted in the Lord's punishment. The captain of the ship, they were going through the dark of night, and he saw lights faintly in the distance. As they continued to go through, cut through the waters, he noticed that the lights were getting closer and closer, so he called for the signalman to send out this message. Alter your course 
10 degrees south, which quickly came back to reply, alter your course 10 degrees north. The captain was ticked, Brother Ken. I'm the captain. They disobeyed, him, disobeyed my command, so his pride was hurt. He told that signalman, send him this message. Alter your course 10 degrees. I am the captain. To which came the reply, alter your course 10 degrees. I am seaman third class Jones. <laughs> the captain is peeved now. A seaman telling me what to do? You send him this message. I alter your course 10 degrees, for I am a battleship. To which came the reply, alter your course, because I'm a lighthouse. Oh. <laughs> Stick it, Captain. You know, pride, man. Pride. It's what God hates most. It's what got our world initially into the mess that it's in. Pride is what keeps us in the mess. It keeps the mess going. And you know what, friends? It doesn't matter our age, how mature we think we are, how long we've been a Christian, how long we've been a church member. Pride is a disease of the human heart that affects us all. Everybody say all. All. Oh, y'all said it like you believe it. It does, man. Because, you know, it makes all of us think we're that ship's captain. It makes us at times think we're bigger, badder, and better than we really are. Hey, so we need to remember verses like this, James 4, 6, where it says that God opposes the proud, but he is kind to those that are humble. Isaiah 2, 12. For the Lord of heaven has a day of reckoning planned when he will punish the proud. Yes, the haughty will be laid low. And in Proverbs 29, 23 says this, is that the pride of a man shall bring him low. But I love this, but the humble in spirit shall enjoy glory. I like that verse better than all the rest of them. In other words, God is going to do away with the proud, but for the humble in spirit, he's got something waiting for us. We can't even imagine. Amen. And you, what's that? I said amen. Amen. I, I almost passed out. I thought that's what you said. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it, friends. Pride. It's what caused Lucifer to fall. Yeah and drag our parents down with him and us with them. Pride, it caused the 12 disciples to argue with each other, and it was pride that caused the early church to almost split and fall apart. So you know what that tells me? It's been around forever, and it's going to be here till Jesus comes back, and it's going to affect even us within God's church. Hey, just real, I'll tell you, one way I know, Dennis and I were joking. I came out and said, you know, you in my chair, get up. You know, this is one way I've seen pride work in churches. Oh, yeah. People got their own what? That's my seat, buddy. And don't you sit in it. We were at one church. A visitor, yeah, a visitor came and sat in this old lady's seat. Oh. Uh, anyway, sat in this lady's seat, and when she came in the sanctuary, I'll cover my face. I'll stand there. She stood there and just kept looking at him. I would ask somebody, what is she doing? Preacher, don't you know that's her seat? Of course, the visitor lady never came back. I didn't want her to come back either, but anyway. So we got to be careful that pride don't infest us. Amen? Amen. Because where else would the devil want to spread pride and destruction than in the house of God? The Tower of Babel, man, I'll never see it again the same way as I did as a kid in Sunday school with the flannel board. There was a whole lot more to it. And that teacher, bless her heart, did the best she could. Hey, Lance, she was good just to get us to sit down and shut up long enough to listen to her. But it didn't, not just a story, y'all, 
about a bunch of people trying to build a tower to reach where God was. Oh, no, because they, they didn't even care about God because they thought there were a whole bunch of them and a whole bunch of ways to get to him. But there's one way, and it's Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Almighty God, man, I, God, I hope you'll just take this time we've had together. And as we go out of this place, may your word burn in our hearts and in our spirit all throughout the week. God, may your word be so precious to us. We can't start a day without it. And when we read it, may you speak to us. God, help us not just to learn it, but help us to live it. And it's in the blessed name of Jesus we ask you these things. Amen.